Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast, episode 13. This is the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, I'm in your house. I'm in Boston. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We've been traveling. The Cube's back in the, the season again. Great to see you. Yeah, to be in the for coming Cube in, house. I'm glad you got the your stack of Wall Street journals there. We're well, gonna, a lot of news this week. We're going to dissect. I got my news. New York Times behind me <laughs> online right here. Washington Post had a great article about Elon Musk turning Twitter into a right-wing network. Meanwhile, their big DeSantis launch failed. We're going to talk about Celtics that. Celtics game last night. You were I, at. I went that to the Celtics the, game. That's the yeah. big news. Yeah. We're, we're still alive, baby. <laughs> <laughs> History in the making. No team has ever come back from down 3-0 in the NBA, uh, Eastern Finals or anything else. Um, VMware extends the deadline for the Broadcom deal. Um, we were at Red Hat Summit. You were at Dell Tech World. Microsoft Build Conference happened. Uh, we, were, we couldn't make it up there. It was a data conference. Just so much going on, David. You know, just... You know, Ethernet turned 50 years old. So that's- Bob makes, Metcalf, makes me feel my old. former colleague. Yeah, you know, we'll get a lot of stuff to dig into the Cube. Again, the Cube is in high season right now. The, the winds of change are swirling with AI. Again, AI continues to dominate the storylines uh, in the tech. I mean, when you know it's going crazy when CNBC is running you know, AI stories everywhere. And, and and the way they, it's funny to watch them, how they talk to mainstream uh, financial buyers. They kind of dumb it down. We're a little bit further along than that. Here we go deeper, um, but they, they're they doing a good job. I like the coverage, love the AI drive. A lot of AI washing, pretenders, you know, saying, I got a service, it's AI enabled. You know, we even have some AI that we're working on. So I think there's going to be a very highly accelerated vetting process of pretenders and players. And unlike the dot-com bubble, it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to dig into that too. But yeah, great to be in Boston for Red Hat Summit. You just came back from Dell Tech. Yeah, World. I was at Dell Tech World, and the big news there was Project Helix. It, it kind of buried it a little bit, but then it, you know came front and center. But that was to me the the lead is. And I asked I asked actually asked Jeff Clark, and then um, and then uh, Nvidia uh, Michael Dell interviewed Jensen. It was a, it was a pre record, and then Nvidia came on on the cube um, with Dell. And I asked them, I said, would you have announced Project Helix? I think I asked Jeff Clark this. Would you have announced Project Helix if it were not for ChatGPT? He said, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we would have. We've been working on this for a while. So it wasn't, you know, GPT washing. At the same time, I don't think it would have got the, you know, the, the attention of the mm -hmm. audience. And then uh, Jeff Clark had, he had DTW GPT and they had this kind of fake thing where he was talking to it. And that was kind of fun too. Yeah. But every, it's everywhere. I'm sure it was at Red Hat Summit too, right? Front and center with Ansible. Yeah. I mean, that I was... Mean, AI powered Ansible. Ansible was this little acquisition that they did. Everyone in the Lightspeed, right? Lightspeed is AI based. They got AI, OpenShift AI. So I told you about that. I told you I found that on GitHub. <laughs> you did. You, <laughs> you broke that story. We could have broken that story earlier. Yeah. Didn't want to rain on their parade at Red Hat Summit. But Red Hat, Red Hat was bought by IBM for like $35 billion. So I'll get the number, maybe 25, 30, look at the number. Oh, no, that's right, 34, 35 well, billion. Yeah. It was a big number. And IBM Arvin was betting on Red Hat. And I think it's looking like it's going to pan, play out. And they're maintaining their roots to open source. They're keeping their Red Hat brand and vibe. Matt Hicks is the CEO, took over for James Whitehurst. Who, no, Paul Comey took over for James Whitehurst. The guy started his career in IT, okay? And he's been in open source from day one. He's now the CEO. Just a great story. He knows what he's Matt talking Hicks. about. Matt Hicks. Matt yeah. Hicks. You know, I saw Paul Paul Cormier last summer down the Cape. <laughs> I went down early. I used to go down and do my breaking analysis when I had a house down there. It's all torn down. But I saw him sitting at the bar. He and his wife. He was the nicest guy. Yeah. He's got a house down and there. Guess who, he guess looks who, at me. He goes, hey, I know you. I need to introduce yeah. me as the Cube guy. The <laughs> Cube guy. <laughs> well, guess who, who else knows? Stu Miniman happened to run into him at the office. Hey, I just saw Dave Alonis. He's yeah. like, what? <laughs> so again, love that company. Red Red Hat is just, I mean, they're just so transparent. And I think they could be a model. You know, someone said, you know, we always say there never could be another Red Hat in open source. Well, I think there could be another Red Hat in open source, and it's Red Hat. Um, you always and, used to say that. And, and Red Hat has longevity, and, and the, they still maintain their commercial position. And by the way, that's growing. They have, their ecosystem's growing. They had Ruba Borna on. She was at AWS. She was keynoting at IBM there, showing some uh, support. Um, you had Dell has an appliance now with Red Hat on it, um, the cloud player. So you're seeing a lot of Red Hat commercial ecosystem, like from like a VMware type of role. But at the same time, they're also in the open source communities where they're driving a lot of the projects. So I think Red Hat could be a leadership uh, case study. That's something that I'm watching very closely with Red Hat because 
I think the open source world is going to be rocked hard by AI. I just feel it. I can see some early signs. I don't have the whole puzzle put together yet, Dave, but to me, um, I think AI is going to change the face of open source. I think open source software is going to change and evolve in a dramatically better way than it is today, just because it has to at the scale. So I think that's going to be an, an amazing story. We're going to continue to ride that. And you already see the cloud native content on siliconangle.com up. You get the AI content hitting that as well. Uh, and we're up to you know about a million uniques a quarter of unique traffic. And it's really been phenomenal. Uh, rise in, in, in our community numbers. So, and, and just the engagement's been great. I so, want to, do you mind if I share a few th other things from Dell Tech World? Sure, yeah. So Satya came on remote, Jensen I mentioned came on remote. James Cameron spoke, he was interviewed for like 45 minutes with Allison Dew. Did you know he goes by Jim? No. Yeah, he goes by Jim. She introduced him as Jim Cameron. I'm like, you call him Jim? She goes, yeah, this is, that's what he goes by, Jim Cameron. He was amazing. Yeah. The guy was just like, so he really was engaging with the audience. And the thing was in the audience, the questions he got were unreal. And you know why? It's because a bunch of Dell customers came from the movie industry and they know all this technical stuff. They were talking, well, John Favreau has this technology. How does it compare with yours? It was, it was incredible. And then of course, a lot of Apex stuff, but they remember last year, Project Alpine, which we loved because it's super cloud. Well, they had turned that into a product to run in the cloud on AWS and Azure, I think GCP. And then they announced last year was Project Frontier, which is the edge management capability. They announced that, they got a common storage layer between those two, and they announced Project Fort Zero, um, which is um, you know a, a, a zero trust security. So the, they're t turning their pro projects, their R&D into products which is a really good thing. And of course the cube was there, wall to wall. The coverage was <laughs> awesome, three days. It was good. 13 years of Dell Tech World. Yeah, this was our, let's see, I guess 14th year, right? Because we started in 2010, yeah. uh, EMC. Yeah. Where I, and I was talking, I, my, my interview with Michael Dell, you, people should listen to that. He was really good, yeah, he was, was always good. But, that was a great uh, interview by thank the way. You, yeah. What was the takeaway? You know, so I, the, the most interesting thing to me was the last question I asked, which was essentially a long-winded, if you were 25 today, what company would you start? It, you know what his answer was? He, he, he basically said, well, if I were 19, he was kind of correcting me because that's when he started his company, and I were in my dorm room, I would really focus on the intersection between healthcare and tech. And so I would go deep into the healthcare and do a startup around that, which is kind of, that was a, it was yeah, an epiphany. and we were we were talking on your breaking analysis as a guest. Thanks for having me on your podcast yeah. uh, about um, with David Floyer around where these changes are going to come from. All the verticals in the cloud scale, hyperscale, so AWS, Azure, Google, and when we talk to those people in those companies, the leadership, they're seeing massive pickup in verticals, industries. So you're gonna, I think there's going to be a massive wave on healthcare life sciences. Obviously, they're very tech savvy. They love compute. They love data. So I think compute data and AI will be a major uh, pivot pivot axes that people turn on. And I think there's going to be a lot of value. Healthcare in particular, there's so much to be refactored there. You know what I love about sitting down with you every week is because we have the historical perspective. We've both been around a while yeah. and uh, and I'm inspired by I, when I see Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger up there in their <laughs> 90s. Well, Charlie, Charlie Munger's like 99, he's still got it. But, because they have that historical So are we going to be billionaires and then we sit around think, shooting, man, the, shooting the breeze? I'm not, I'm not <laughs> retiring anytime soon. Somebody asked me the other day, what do you, what do you and John want to do with, with you know, your company? And I'm like, the Cube Global. He goes, oh, you don't want to just retire? I'm like, no, we're scaling. I told someone I'm going to drop dead on the Cube. But <laughs> I'm going to die, I'm going to die on the Cube. But so the reason I bring this up is, is <laughs> don't, don't, not good. so the reason I bring this up is you remember Nicholas Negroponte during the internet wave, it was like bits versus atoms, which industries are going to be most affected by the industry, yeah. is, by, by the internet is going to be bits versus atoms. What's different about AI is every industry is going to be affected. It's yeah. not a bits versus atoms thing. It's not which industry, it's all industries. Yeah, and that's why I was watching CNBC today, and you have it in your office, I love how you have that, to see what how they talk to the masses. And they had you know, Duncan Davis on, who, who gave a great hot take. Um, but a lot of hot takes out there come from people who look to do pattern matching. And I think we're at a time now where pattern matching doesn't work. When I think AI is one of those ways where you can you can see the obvious things. Okay, replatforming and refactoring business and verticals. But I think you can't predict which company's going to win because whoever's leaning into this next wave has to ride it and kick ass with it, like we talked about in the last pod. But I truly believe that there'll be new names that no one's ever heard of that are going to come out of the woodwork and they might even compete against NVIDIA. If NVIDIA is bogarting the market and they're hogging all the profits, 
what's going to stop some you know, collaboration between someone who's ex uh, Annapurna and someone from ex AMD get together and say, hey, let's start something and let's go compete with NVIDIA hard and do something different. Mm. Um, who knows? Well, so I, I think, in, I, I don't, well, to me, NVIDIA doesn't get disrupted. I think they are the disruptor. Um, and I think we called this, I mean, literally, Floyer called it in 2011. He called Intel as it being in trouble. Um, and then he and I, maybe a couple of years ago, said they're really, really, really in trouble. I think Intel just, I mean, Pat Gelsinger, we love Pat. I mean, he's been a huge fan, but I, I just don't, don't think. Pat's, don't got, Pat's got something going against him right now, and that is, is that he hasn't been on the cube. And what's happening, he's, his luck is turning against him, Dave. Well, he doesn't have stock you asking gonna, him, is this a cul-de-sac? And things like questions stock, like that. And challenging sell him. Intel stock. If you're buying, sell it. Because it's going to drop like a yeah. rock until everybody Gelsinger comes on the <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> selling that, it. But the thing is, they're just... He's probably too busy. They're he's still Joe Biden. And, but he's an amazing individual. Is somebody who can really get people focused. But they've just got too many things going on. I mean, we were saying, you know, give up Foundry, focus on design. He's not doing that. He went in the opposite direction. I, he's I doing think everything it's, I think possible. He's to throw darts at Intel right now, but I, I won't bet against Intel. Um, they have a great brand. I think they're gonna they're they're gonna survive. Oh, I think yeah. they're gonna survive. Yeah. I think there's no question. I think you know what's gonna happen. I think they could. Well, I don't know. I mean, to me. They are a business that's going to last for a long, 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 long time, and they can milk that. But do you see Intel getting back its leadership position? I mean, I, it, I do. I think that could it could happen. There's a lot of geopolitical things going on. You never know. I mean, you got a pre election, presidential election coming up. He's obviously in with the U.S. Biden supporting him, and who knows what's going to happen? I think there could be a wild card in there. So again, I mean, we need they, it. They're still you know, huge. the U.S. needs it. Yeah, yeah. I mean. But I'll tell you right now, silicon. I would rather see the silicon angle. I, the, I, I would rather see Intel spin out its foundry business as a U.S. based company. Yeah, I think that. And I think that's the right call. I think they're they, they're really having, in my view, they've got a really tough road to hoe to try to be both foundry yeah. and design. Yeah, I mean, you wrote a great multiple stories on Intel um, that people should look up. That's really good. I mean, I think you got a good handle on that. Called ARM, called Nvidia. We called Intel. We, challenge, we laid out those challenges. Um, and, you know, sometimes people just don't want the press. I mean, look at Microsoft. They're pressing their advantage in AI with their build conference, but they're not really engaging with the media. Like, they they, they engage in scripted media. And, the press and, release kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, if they let us, I mean, I won't say it. They're really scripted with the media. Everything's tailored. Um, it's a show. They did a, an amazing job with OpenAI, that launch. I thought that was phenomenal. In fact, it was so good that it put AWS on their heels. So Amazon has to respond to promote the fact that they were in the AI so business. Google. Yeah. Who was, who was number one in AI, they had to respond and they kind of fumbled it. <laughs> it's like, hey, we're in it too. And then I.O., yeah. Google I.O. was pretty good. I thought they did a good job at Google I.O. But but their first attempt at you know, showing Bard off was not that great. This plug-in concept of AI is pretty interesting. I still think that the foundational models uh, with LLM, I think OpenAI is going to be pretty solid. I think that's going to be a very big... Well, we, you were saying on TV today, you heard somebody say basically that they've built the moat, the game's over. I don't believe that. Do you believe that? No, I don't I don't think there's one language model of rule the law. I think they're going to be a winner. Um, the question is, if they're the browser moment, are they Netscape? Remember, Microsoft, yeah, there you go. Microsoft, right? Microsoft just... killed Netscape. Yeah. Right, so Microsoft has a very strong DNA and competitive strategy with developers, and the stuff they're rolling out with OpenAI under that banner with Bing is solid. They got all the the bell bells and whistles that developers love: built-in automation, plugins, integrate their products, create sustainable competitive advantage across the portfolio. Um, they're, they introduced Fabric, this single integrated data analytics platform. Which Fabric is interesting. And, and I, I would ex fully expect Snowflake to respond to that because they're trying to basically be Snowflake, yeah. be the Snowflake data cloud. And Snowflake's way ahead of them. But, um, but it's Microsoft. So you, you have I mean, to pay attention you know, to Microsoft. And I think Snowflake's going to announce some stuff at Summit in June next month that it's going to be. Well, what's Microsoft's market cap? Are they larger than uh, two, Amazon? So right now it's Apple is uh, 2.76. Let's trillion. go through the top list. You got, I know you got Apple, the list. Apple, 2.76. Microsoft, uh, 2.5. Uh, Alphabet, 1.6. Amazon, 1.2. NVIDIA, 963 billion. So they're going to be a trillionaire soon. 
And then Meta is down to 670. By the way, NVIDIA in 2022 was 400 million. Unbelievable, John. And Berkshire is now bigger than, than, than Meta. Berkshire and NVIDIA are bigger than, than Meta. Meta took and Meta was a trillion. Yeah. But yeah, they, they, they're struggling. How, how was Dell's um, event? Did they have a lot of multi cloud? It was, it was a ton of multi cloud. And that, you know, Dell, Dell's doing super cloud. Whereas I would say HPE is doing more hybrid. I mean, Dell's doing hybrid too, but, but Dell's vision, you know, Jeff Clark lays it out. We're building this abstraction layer, Project Alpine, which is now, you know, I know Apex or, or storage for Azure and AWS. It's super cloud storage. Mm -hmm. And so they were all over that. And then their Project Frontier stretches out to the edge with that same common storage layer. So it was a lot of multi-cloud uh, talk. The godfather of multi-cloud by design uh, Chuck Witten was on the cube, <laughs> and so you know he was definitely touting that in his keynote and on the cube. And yeah, everybody was talking about it. Yeah, I, mean, I thought I thought my um, the build conference, which is for developers, was all about AI, and they didn't have a lot of cloud. But they had they weaved in Azure. They got Azure as a service. I think people there are seeing an uptake, and I think Amazon's responding. So the Copilot thing was announced for Windows 11, Fabric, um, and again, this is we'll see how the developers pick that up. Um, what else? I mean, you got Splunk surprises investors with stronger than expected earnings and revenue. That surprised me. I didn't think they were going to hit their number. And and yeah, the subscription business is doing better, right? But still, Splunk. Well, I, I heard they're, they're they're increasing their prices to get more revenue. So I heard people from the field, but I heard Splunk wasn't doing well, um, and that they had a lot of takeouts, people um, takeout campaigns from competitors. But apparently, their earnings are up. I'm not up to speed on Splunk in terms of their mix of business, whether they have a lot of larger whales in their uh, whales in their account. It's, it's a, it's they got a lot of competition coming in, right? There's, yeah. there's Datadog, there's Elastic, you got some, some of these, you know, smaller startups are going after them. And maybe everybody wants all these observability companies. They all want a piece of Splunk. Nutanix share surge on earnings. They have an upbeat outlook. Um, Nutanix is interesting. I mean, Workday stock is higher and they got a former uh, Cube alumni over there. Uh, Carl Eschenbach running co-CEO, and they got a new C CFO, Zane Rowe. Um, you oh, from VMware, yeah, right. Yeah, and they got Carl Eschenbach, co-CEO. So Snowflake stock is down on mis misguided. You're all over that. Well, they was. were down, and now they're up on AI sympathy today. So it's all right. It's like everybody's up. But yeah, they got they got crushed. It was really interesting. I mean, um, you know, Slootman was basically saying, hey, we've, you know, we've seen these cycles before. It will end. But they're, they are really like, in so many ways, like AWS, Snowflake. They, they use similar terminology. The, the models are very, very linked. Uh, Snowflake, it, most of their business is on AWS, uh, but more and more they're doing some stuff with, with uh, Microsoft. Not so much Google. Google's really not playing ball with Snowflake because Google's a competitor, right? They want BigQuery to be, if you want, if you want Google's best stuff, you got to go to, big, uh, to BigQuery. So. Yeah, just a lot of stuff happening. Events coming up. We got uh, we got Databricks event. We got Snowflake coming up. Um, hey, we got a ton of HPE Discover. We got our startup we just, showcase. We're doing Cisco two Live too. Let me just go through it. So we got Cisco Live in two weeks, right? A week mm -hmm. after Memorial Day week, and then from there we go to Reinforce, right? Yep, reinforced. In Anaheim. I heard the numbers aren't strong there, but you know, we'll see. And then I'm coming up to Palo Alto that week to hang with you mm -hmm. and we just do some stuff in the studio. We're doing some stuff in the studio for SuperCloud, which is July 18th. And then the following week is uh, HPE Discover and MongoDB and, and uh, Summit. Dot Local, and then Snowflake Summit to, to round out the, uh, the spring. And then we got SuperCloud on July 18th. I Don't forget gonna, Databricks. In Databricks too, that same week, mm -hmm. and we got a, 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 a we got SuperCloud July 18th. We got some other stuff going on that we haven't announced in July, and then we got some other stuff going on the first week of August, and then we got uh, no, when's, November. Uh, oh, we got Google Cloud next. When is that? That's uh, yeah, our, that's end of August. Uh, the events are flying, and then in you so got fast, VMware. So I'm going to spend more time in Palo Alto this summer than I am back here. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to go well. <laughs> right. Get you a cubicle. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have cubicles, but it sounded good. So, um, yeah, you're, you're more than welcome to hang out there. Just get a little Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. Well, I usually don't fly in the summer until VMworld, but... Uh, the queue is back. Yeah. Events are back. It's interesting events, just like more and more 
bigger events. I think the big events are coming back and then smaller company events. Companies going back to their more traditional elite VIP customer events or kickoffs, combo. Executive. That's what Mongo's doing with Dot Local. Yeah. And and you know, CrowdStrike's doing it again. We'll be a CrowdStrike, we'll be a UI path. You know, Palo Alto's doing it too, this, these smaller events. Um, yeah, I mean, I love when the big cube rolls out. I mean, Snowflake will have a big monster cube How there. was attendance at uh, Red Hat Summit? It was good. I think they had like five, 6,000 so people. So last year they were purposely small. It was only like 2,000 people. They did the theater in the round at the Westin. I'm telling you, Dell Tech World had 10,000 people there. Which yeah. was, it was as big, if not bigger, I mean, than last year. The Red Hat packed. community, it's mostly open source. So they're not really conference goers for Red Hat, because Red Hat usually goes to events. And so Red Hat Summit's really more of the insiders and more of the, their top people. But what they did this year is they folded Ansible Fest into Red Hat Summit because they used to do two separate events because they're bringing the Ansible automation as front and center and they want to bring those customers and partners into the fold and give them a bigger platform. And certainly with IBM, uh, I think that Ansible message, the product is going to surge because those customers are so loyal. I mean, the loyalty and the satisfaction they have with the product, they love it. And they've been doing automation for years. So playbooks, automating playbooks, perfect use case for AI. Low hanging fruit, totally operationalized already. AI fits perfectly into that. That's the kind of thing we're going to see out of the gate. These nice automation opportunities, well understood, um, heavy lifting. And I, I was joking because Andy Jassy has that famous line we always used to talk about when we interviewed him was, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Amazon handles, it just handles all the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Well, AI actually can do not only undifferentiated heavy lifting, but the differentiated heavy lifting. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> that you couldn't do before. Well, this is why I think AI is going to be very cloud-like in its scale. So if you look at NVIDIA's market cap, they're approaching Amazon. I mean, think about that. Yeah, it could cross over. I mean, Amazon is huge with AWS and that, uh, NVIDIA. A card company, graphics card company from years ago, yeah. monster, right? So look at that's the, how fast things are changing, and you know you get a great product that scales up like that. I think if they put a graphics uh, GPU cloud, that could fly. I can see that. I can see that happening. So again, just it's just so dynamic. The, the, the winds of change are, are here, Dave. It's just incredible, uh, and I think the dot com bubble analogy that we were talking about. Um, on your breaking analysis with David Floyer was, and this is what people will talk about in the industry, is this the same as the dot-com bubble? And the over, overwhelming answer is yes, it is. However, the bubble will pop faster because it's easier to accelerate who's got what. So people say, oh, I'm an AI company now. Like, what does that even mean? See, dot-com is slow, the gestation period before that people found out was fraudulent. It's a paradigm shift. Yeah, yeah, be really yeah. Oh, yeah, throw money at it. Yeah. It took a while to percolate. Here, boom, you can smell it out like it's going to be high accelerated. In fact, Ali Gotzi was on CNBC basically saying the same thing this morning. So, so I think that's the general consensus is that, you know, it's going to be a lot of like, I don't know what it looks like. How do you tell a winner from a loser, uh, the, uh, the players from the pretenders? And it's going to come back down to look at their product. Do they have AI in it or not? And are you an AI arms dealer? Are you an AI consumer? Are you building it into your application? So there's so many attributes of AI, like the web. It's going to be hard for the average investor who's not technical to figure it out. So you, we were, you and I were talking earlier about who made the money in the internet, right? It was you know, they always say pick pick and the pick and the axe companies, right? So. You know, who were they? I mean, we said Cisco. I mean, every EMC well, actually Bob, made a people lot People who dough. made the servers and put yeah. them in data centers. The yeah. data centers, which were the, the uh, ISPs at that time, which is like Exodus Communications, companies like Digex was around at that time, and a variety of hosting companies. Because you had to host stuff somewhere. Yeah. No one could build the data center out. No one had as big as like Hewlett Packard. So I think the hosting companies emerged, the service provider area, and the, the Cisco's, who sold DSU, CSUs to everybody and all servers. Sun, Sun Microsystems, HP, a lot of people don't know. Dell, HP, Dell, Dell, yeah, they all cranked during, yeah. the, during the internet boom. You got funding, you had to yeah. build out, yeah. right? And so money comes in, and I, so I think with AI, Amazon will win, Azure will win, um, a lot of those suppliers to those Google, funding, definitely, Google right? will I mean, win, OpenAI is going to win, and then these new emerging layers are, are coming out, fin, uh, financial, uh, Foundation model ops, they call it FM ops. So FM stands for foundation model. So foundation model ops is a good category. Training, 
and stuff. And then you get the foundation models, proprietary and open source, and then tooling on top of it. That's for the app developers. So you're seeing a whole new foundation model AI stack emerging that looks a lot different than the cloud stack. And look at how fast yeah, it's moving. It's just so it's, fast. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, Meta got fined, did you see that? 1.3 billion? because they transfer data to the U.S. and they're like, U.S. government help. Can we get some guidelines here? VMware extended the, the deal, uh, the deadline for closing the Broadcom deal. So that's getting pushed out. You know, it's interesting. You know, a lot of hallway conversations about, you know, VMware and Broadcom. I think that when you think about the competitive environment, that VMware is actually a bulwark against cloud dominance, right? Because you got the hybrid cloud thing going on. You got super cloud going on. Hawk Tan saying cross cloud multi-cloud is something that he actually wants to bet on, which I think means Tenzu doesn't get killed, which I thought was going to be scrutinized very heavily. The other thing is, and you might have, might have heard this at, at Red Hat Summit, is a lot of customers are saying, well, you know, I'm a VMware customer, but I'm looking at alternatives like Red Hat just to hedge my bets. Even Dell, uh, the Dell C CIO even told us you know, a couple of weeks ago on an analyst call, yeah, we're, we're hedging our bets too. And that's, they were like VMware's cousins for a while. So they're like, yeah, hey, we're a big VMware shop, but we're looking at alternatives. You never know. So I think actually the Broadcom VMware deal is going to, going to create more competition. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely true. There's two things I'm looking at right now, the Broadcom deal. One is uh, scoops like Amazon and they're building chips. Will they do it, abandon those or not? That's one story I'm working on. Um, the other area I'm looking at is how fast does virtual machine um, conversion from VMs to containers and Kubernetes? So cloud native is, got a really strong momentum with containers and Kubernetes. How fast is the enterprise shifting off, off VMs to, to that environment? Um, and, there's a, and they're not moving that fast. Well, there's a number one use case from what I'm hearing from people close to the situation. Now, with respect to Broadcom's interest in cross cloud or- Hold on a second, before, before sorry to interrupt, but that, that uh, Broadcom AWS rumor that's floating around, there was a similar rumor about Apple and Broadcom. Did you see that? <coughs> yeah, they actually closed the deal. And they closed the deal. That yeah. that a guy from UBS could be said it could be worth fifteen billion by you yeah. know like mid end of the yeah, decade. Apple did a multi year billion dollar deal with Apple for the chips. The reason I bring that up is this, is it AWS just trying to negotiate, right? And they're ultimately going to do a deal. I think, or, I, think, or, I think Broadcom has a very like Nvidia leverage on supply chain and, and quality products. So Broadcom makes a. Uh, a very strong product. I interviewed a lot of the Broadcom engineers for the um, ISC in, in Hamburg just this couple weeks ago and uh, just launched, we're, we're, did the pre-records. Broadcom isn't just a chip company. It's, a, it's, a, it's got a fabric, right? So like, it's not, it's differentiated. It's hard to replicate. Now, Amazon has probably got a, a huge sales order <laughs> coming in from Broadcom. Oh, we just jacked the prices up. You know, if, the, if that's the, the way they work and Broadcom does do that from what we report, Amazon is going to say, whoa, 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 hold on. You're charging a tax, that, so they'll get something going on. So my guess is, and what I've heard is, they have an initiative to replace that Broadcom. And I heard that they're abandoning it. So we're, we'll see, I don't know, it's not confirmed yet. But, but again, Broadcom has good product like NVIDIA. And they're Their competitors well. in, the, in, the, in the Nick space. Remember, NVIDIA bought Mellanox. And so they're all about InfiniBand. Right, like Larry Ellison yeah. used to be. And Broadcom, of course, is, you know, there's Ethernet. Is okay, Ethernet's silicon. 50 years old, turn this week, 50 years old, okay? Ethernet has an ecosystem, right? And and InfiniBand, um, it's, come on. Ethernet, well, I was talking compete, to- Can't compete with Ethernet. I was talking to Floyer about this. I said the same thing. I'm like, Ethernet's going to just keep getting better and better and better. He goes, yeah, but InfiniBand is good, it's fast. That's why Mellanox Melanex bought- uh, The simplicity of the design. Of, of the, the layering of technologies built on top of it made a big difference. And if you look at what Broadcom's doing on their products, they have that same approach. They use the standard and they're layering stuff in and around it. So, yeah, they got a better product and it's, it's and the ecosystem is, 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 is there. And they got the vertical and horizontal integration. So I'm very high on Broadcom stock, by the way, too. I think they're going to be another NVIDIA pop. Well, so, I mean, I, I <clears throat> Mentioned that a while ago, I did an analysis of, uh, of, of all of the semiconductor stocks. Remember, John, the semiconductor stocks were coming back, they were bouncing back. I had Ivana Delevska on, breaking analysis. Was that a harbinger? And I was like, you know, you know 
look at these guys. At the time, I was like, if anything, NVIDIA looks like it's overvalued. And of course, the stock's done nothing but run up since then. And I said, Broadcom looks yeah. undervalued yeah. just from a just pure valuation standpoint. But NVIDIA's up on the yeah, AI but, hype. But my Broadcom VMware comment, though, was like, I got a little distracted with NVIDIA there. But if the one speculation everyone's looking at, will Hawk Tan keep VMware or not? Will he do what he did to CA versus that? So the question is- What do you is, mean, will he keep it? Yeah, he's gonna, what do you mean keep it? Well, keep it and not like break it down to its bare bones. So the, the story that we're reporting on SiliconANGLE is this momentum with Hot Tan to keep VMware. He's buying- You mean intact? Let me keep it intact. He's buying the vision of super cloud, basically, and cross cloud services, which is probably. cloud native. He, 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 that's the word that he's, he's you know, yeah, so dug in and he feels like but, there's an opportunity there. But here's the tell sign. If and I'm hearing some rumblings, not confirmed, but rumors that a lot of engineers are leaving VMware. Now, that could be just VCs poaching talent, but the question is, if there's churn at the engineering level, that's not going to bode well for VMware maintaining its dominance. They need to have people in there building the products. They're known for their technical acumen. Yeah, but, Broad, so, but Broadcom has engineers out the wazoo. I mean, that's what they do. Well, they're, they're, they're semiconductor guys. They are, but now they're software guys too. We'll it's see. going to be half again, of their business again, we'll, be software. Well, this is what we're doing. Uh, uh, no, I know what you're saying. Their engineers yeah. are, are semiconductor people. Yeah, I'm not sure true. they can go right over and start doing cloud, slinging cloud natives code. That's my point. They'll have to either ma yeah. maintain we'll those, they'll have to retain we'll those. We're, to, we're you're right, no, but you're right. They'll either have to retain those people from VMware or, or bring them in. Yeah, we're, look, we're we're working on. It. I'm, 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 that's what we're that's what I'm staring at right now. But that's the way I see it happening. But I do agree with you that there is competition. I mean, Nutanix is up. You got Splunk out there. So you got Snowflake. You got a lot of players that could come in and start eating the lunch of VMware's core business vSphere and take over the 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 new wave with cloud native and AI powered services. So again, it's going to come down to what the install base is doing under the buyer. You got the the data on your breaking analysis is if they're showing um, a momentum on spend then VMware is going to be solid. VMware is like a utility. Their customers love VMware. The, the vSphere and with the promise of cross-cloud and multi-cloud, I think VMware has got a legitimate shot at being that control plane. So, but everybody's trying that. Everyone's trying to be the control plane for multi-cloud. It's going to be a land grab. So first one who can swim out to the dock first gets the prize. Well, and, and look, as much as we were talking about before about people thinking about alternatives, VMware is a durable business. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's they talk about a moat. I mean, they have built up a, a, a 20, 25 year moat that's pretty So, I mean, IT people, they, and VMware is good. The product's good. People like it. The processes are built up around it. It is, it has become, John, the software mainframe. What Maritz said, you know, whatever it was 15 years ago, that has happened. And so, that is a durable business, and Broadcom likes to, of course. So there's a survey, I saw Ray Wang's business. tweet, and the Sar Sarbjeet weighed in too. Um, Sarbjeet? <laughs> Sarbjeet is in there. Sarbjeet is in there. So there's a good question. When will cloud computing take over on-premise computing past 50% share? According to a 2022 report by Gartner, 60% of workloads are still on-premises, while 40% are in the cloud. Ah. CCing. <laughs> Dave lives in Ray Wang, Sarp uh, uh, I missed this. So th within one year, two and a half, three years, wait, Ray Wang, and point, my point, I'm growing into the period never camp. Repatriation is picking up steam. Who said this? Ray Wang. So re He's a repatriate? He's a repatriate. <laughs> Ray Wang is a re repatriate. <laughs> you repatriate you. I'm going to tweet that in right now. You repatriate yeah, you. Yeah, that's good. You got a got CC Fitzy if you're going to do that, right? So I, I hate autos, correct. So, but definitely CC at Charles, what is it, Charles Fitzgerald? Is it at Charles Fitzgerald? I'll tell you what it is, at Charles Fitz. I think it's, it's Charles, Charles Fitz. It's Charles Fitz, yeah. So I love his stuff. I quote him all the time. He's so, so good. Um, so I wrote a piece, uh, written two pieces now in the last you know month or so. Um, first one I did is, is uh, don't be fooled by slowing cloud growth. Cost optimization is a feature, not a bug. However, and then the second one was desperately seeking cloud repatriation. In that post, in that second post, John, I have some data that I think is pretty interesting, um, you know, because we know we got the ETR data. So it shows, we just say Gartner was, so here's the thing I've been talking about is Andy Jassy says that 
90% of the workloads are still on-prem. I've been hearing this for three or four years now. <laughs> and it's just, I, I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. And so the ETR data shows that somewhere around 48 to 52% is in the cloud today. Um, so nowhere near 10%, right? Way, way higher. The other thing is, the, the most striking thing that I wrote about was only 14%, this is a survey done late last year, only 14% of the respondents said they're all in on public cloud. And they asked how that's going to change in the next three years, flat. So the point is the world's hybrid. And yeah, so and, and your snowflake data, by the way, too, on churn. Yeah, yeah. No, speaks there's no, volumes. There's, there's no churn. There is no churn. Cloud is here. It's only going to grow. Definitely not a, a patriot. I have I think, Amazon data. I, I, think I have hybrid. AWS data on churn, too. You want to know what it is? Yes, I do. Uh, AWS. This my, is my point ETR. is, I consider hybrid cloud public cloud. See, AWS cloud churn, two percent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right here, Google. Google churn. Now this includes some of their software. Four percent. How about Azure? You want to see Azure? Microsoft. Well, I like this uh, ad hoc. Uh, yeah, I'll give you query. Microsoft right now. M Microsoft. Microsoft churns one percent. <laughs> right? No churn in the cloud. This is not happening. Yeah. Well, the spend. The spend churn, compression. Churn, churn defined as lost customer. Yes, the spend okay. compression because people are dialing down consumption. That's what I wrote. Don't, don't be fooled. That's a feature that you can dial it down because what people are doing is they're optimizing. They're saying, okay, we're going to move to, to lower cost uh, Graviton. We're going to move to lower cost storage tiers. We're going to sign up for uh, better pricing plans. So think about the pricing plans. It yeah. goes on demand, uh, spot, reserved instances, and then optimized plans where you're locking yourself in for a year or, or three years even. And all of that is going to reduce short-term revenue, but what's it going to do, John? It's going to increase the area under the curve over time, right? You math guy, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. yep. right? It's the lifetime value of the customer. I think it's really smart by Amazon and the other cloud vendors you know, to do this. Now, the, now well, here's what's interesting. There's the big question that I have. Will all this large language model and GPT and, and all this AI, is that all going to run in the cloud? I think the answer is no. A lot of the HPC stuff, you did ISC with me, right? I talked to a, I talked to a customer at uh, Dell Tech World. He had half a million cores running in his data center. He goes, I'm not going to do that in the cloud. It's too expensive. So a lot of these generative AI and large language models are going to, even OpenAI runs most of its stuff, I think, in a data center in Ohio. So a yeah. lot of this stuff is going to run, and to Floyer's point today in breaking analysis, a lot of it's going to be AI inferencing at the edge. Yeah. So what does that mean for the cloud guys? How are the it's cloud guys going to change the unit economics there? across the board. It'll still, it won't change churn. It'll be a spend game and then new services. It's going to be who's going to build the next app. So I think the AI waves can actually help the, the, the hyperscalers. And the question is, will Amazon optimize for that or will they optimize for um, trying to be a re, re, uh, cost optimized uh, player? That's the question. Because if they, if they, if Amazon dial, AWS dials back their mojo just to kind of save money and make the numbers, they might lose the opportunity. So you want to be optimized for this next wave of startups. Remember, Amazon Web Services made their bones by helping companies establish SaaS for the same reason why that tax we talked about for web startups was, you know, buy a server, get a data center, all that upfront costs. Amazon made the market. So if they can make that same exact point, this is what I talked to Swami about who heads their AI, if they can go to the AI market saying, for the same reason why you didn't want to provision servers in a data center for SaaS, why do you want to spend all this money for compute, GPUs, for your large language models and foundation models come to Amazon. So I think you'll see more services that will build on that. If they optimize for that from a startup standpoint, like hugging faces of the world. So experimentation, they, they, yes, and then help, get them to a point where Yes, give them access and lift, create that lift. The startups that are going to come out of the woodwork are going to be ones that are misunderstood. Kind of agree with you there, John. The, 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 the 20 right. something year old Steve Jobs out there, Bill Gates, Andy Grove, they're out there. We don't know who they are yet. There'll be unicorns that will come out of this wave that no one's ever seen before. And the existing companies like Salesforce, CrowdStrike, Okta, C3AI, 
uh, Broadcom, Zscaler, MongoDB, Dell, HPE, uh, they're all they're all going to either win or get washed away. I want to I want to give you more data. I got like Great. DR at my fingertips. So you 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 said you think the cloud guys are going to win in AI. So who are the leaders in AI today? Three leaders: Microsoft, AWS, and Google. This is in terms of spending momentum on their platforms and their share of you know, voice, their sentiment. So it's Microsoft, AWS, Google. And then, you know, behind them is Databricks. Databricks, a lot of spending momentum. They're seen as a leader in ML and AI. And then you got Oracle, you got IBM. They're kind of down lower and they're sort of legacy stuff. Data robots up there, H2O AI, way, way, way behind in terms of, of sentiment. And then when you switch to the emerging tech vendors, these are private companies, open AI off the charts. And then of course you get Databricks. TensorFlow is not a company, but it's very popular. Anaconda is kind of a mix of a company and, a, and a, an open source platform. H2O.ai, again, Data Robot is in there, Data IQ, Hugging Face. Hugging Face has a lot of momentum right now. I know it's a company that you've interviewed a number of times um, and several others. But so to your point, I think you're going to have these emerging companies come out of the woodworks and the big AI players, the big three clouds are going to yeah. Dominate. They're going yeah. to do really, really well because they have the tools, they have all the infrastructure, and they got the data in there. Yeah. And so here's another point, just a riff on that. So Amazon, we've been saying that this history moment of the industry has a couple things that, that didn't have before: big hyperscale cloud players. Um, so let's factor this in: large scale data, large scale compute power, edge is developing, so hybrid operations. AI survives because there's now all that in place. In fact, Bob Metcalf, who was at the Computer History Museum celebrating the 50th anniversary of Ethernet, which he invented, actually had a quote, I was going to bring it up on, on the pod, but here it is. Ethernet co-inventor Bob Metcalf on why AI moment may be different this time. He says, quote, I've been watching AI come and go, come and go, and come and go. Like, it's just, oh yeah, it gets, gets hyped up. The models always run out of data, and AI goes mainstream, goes into remission for a while there's a chance it won't happen this time because it's the internet. So you have apps, you have the internet, you have all this data coming and, and now it's there. So you got compute, unlimited data opportunities, unique data that's vertical and horizontal. I mean, we've been saying this on the, on the queue. I mean, Dave, what year do we say? Horizontally scalable, <laughs> vertically differentiated. This is exactly why yeah. AI is going to win. This is exactly why Azure jumped on OpenAI. That's why Microsoft's doubling down on generative AI because the hype cycle matches the the, the market, there's sizzle and steak on the grill right now. So if you want to get, you know, reels not hyped with fraud, it's hyped with reality. So I think AI is going to be one of the biggest waves we've ever seen so far to date. I think it's going to be the biggest. And then, and on the, reminds me of the, the repatriate thing. This is why I actually think the edge can be a real wild card because you got companies like Dell, there's some sort of fresh off of Dell Tech World, but I put HPE in there as well, you know, Cisco, Lenovo, et cetera. They're doing exactly what you said with their infrastructure, horizontally scalable. I asked Jeff Clark this. I said, was there ever a discussion about going, because the edge is so fragmented and, and vertically specific. Was there ever a discussion um, about actually going deeper into verticals and maybe you know focusing on that, putting resources there versus that horizontal? Because of course there was a discussion. I said, well, what was that like? He goes, it didn't pass the Jeff test. Right? <laughs> so his point was, we have to be horizontally scalable. We have to have partnerships to go deeper into those verticals. Yeah. I'm sure H HPE is, 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 is thinking the same way. I'm going to find out at, at Discovery. Yeah, and so this is why, you know, I've been, I took a lot of heat for my comment when I said, um, the half stack developer is the modern developer. Because remember back in the day, well, I'm a full stack developer. I can do yeah. everything from uh, up and down the stack. Half stack was, the horizontal basically cuts the stack in half, so you only got to be worrying about the application. That's exactly what's happening right now in cloud native. The best companies are, are highly productive when they're programming infrastructure as code, which is the cloud, and now you got super computing, super cloud happening, where now you're talking about silicon advances. So this almost matches the same pattern, not that I'm going to go back and be pattern matching, but there's a comparable. You know, the OSI open system systems interconnect model had the physical layers first, data link, and then you saw that cut off at TCP IP. So layers three and four were where the standards were. Everything else was for developers and had could be okay and flex. That's why Ethernet was successful. The industry moved from vertical to horizontal simplicity, very modular, 
you know, it had to be differentiated and, and sustainable, and that was. Ethernet was probably the first example of a horizontal technology that actually was just simple. And, you know, token ring was only two megabits per second. Remember that those days. So I think we're seeing a lot of comparables when these inflection points is when you can get some horizontal scale that can be layered in and, and innovated on top of. That's what I see happening with AI. I don't see anyone yet in place, Databricks nor Snowflake on the data side that can handle this. I think um, the opportunity will be from a new entrant or with hyperscales will enable someone and then figure out how to make them their searches better with that. Just like what Microsoft did with OpenAI, it was a, a co-op, they embraced it and they extended it. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they, they, that from was, a business model standpoint, they yeah. just cut the line and went right to the lead. It was pretty amazing. But you know, to the point about pattern matching, you're right. We, on the one hand, pattern matching, especially if you've got a good historical perspective, is important because you've got a you've learned from your wisdom. On the other hand, if you get, get locked into pattern matching, you think that the past is prologue and it's not. And I think that we've been talking about it all day here. AI inferencing at the edge is really what's going to drive this thing. And I think, I think Floyer's right. I think Apple's got it right. I mean, there's a lot of AI inferencing going on here. Then the, G, the GPU that's inside of this thing is for the screen, right? It's not, they use the NPU, the neural processing unit to do some yeah. of the heavy lifting. Tesla is, is similar. Now, you know, obviously, you know, Jensen well, that, talks this, about this. brings the question up, what we've been saying again, and we'll repeat it here, and this is quasi rant, but the point is in these new markets, is Clay Christensen's innovator's dilemma truly in play here? Or is that thrown out the window? Is all his teachings irrelevant in this new modern era? We should ask Andy Jassy, who was in his class, and, uh, and, and see what he thinks. But I think you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a plausible argument to say there's both sustainable advantage for the big guys and disruptive enabler for the startups. Now, I think personally that we're more like the web early days because in disruptive technologies, it's not yet mainstream and people are bitching and moaning, oh, it's not real hallucinations, you know, regulate it. So I think the fact that AI is not fully baked scares people, but the reality is, is that the startups will see it early. They got the vision, you get a founder, like a young founder, they'll build on it. And when it does go mainstream, they capture the rents. So the startup that was misunderstood, laughed at, small, get some funding, they focus on an area, make it better, they improve it, they bring it to the mainstream and they ride that wave and they make money like Apple, like a Microsoft. You know, those companies were small and well, insiders knew who they were, but mainstream was laughing at the web. You, you know, it's interesting. And computing. You know, it's interesting. Go back to something that John uh, Chambers, I first heard it when he, you were inter interviewing him at his Palo Alto home. He said, there is no entitlement. He worked at Wang, right? <laughs> and he remembered Wang and DG and Digital the and Apollo. At one point. They were hot, I mean, prime. These were the hottest companies on the planet, people. I mean, you haven't even heard of them, right? But look at Microsoft. Microsoft at one point like, was teetering on irrelevance. In fact, I would argue that Microsoft for a long time was irrelevant. Nobody cared what Microsoft did. IBM almost died, you know, when it, when it gave the, the, uh, its monopoly away. Look at Apple. Apple almost ran out of money. Yeah. Okay, so my, my point is that these companies learned from those mini computer deaths and other failures and they were able to survive. Now, now maybe for in the case of Microsoft, they had such a huge well, margin. Microsoft stock was at 26 at one point. Now they're like the most valuable company in the planet. planet. So, so the, 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 this is the thing that, that people, I think, can't compare the old pattern and matching to the current. Back then, those incumbents were beat because it was much slower to make change. The old joke used to be, they move like battle uh, aircraft carriers, not a nimble warship. Um, and it was slow to move a big company. Today, the pivot factor is much easier. If you're in the cloud as an enterprise, you can pivot faster. So if you have smart managers say, well, we're either going to get on this wave or we're going to be dead. They go, okay, time to death. You know, you got <laughs> two years and six days, fix it. Everyone red alert, code red, go. And I think Google's going through that right now. We'll see if Google can come out of their code red. And so I think the, the uh, excuse that incumbents will die, that's easier to predict in a slower market. But I would say right now, an existing company, good management and technical people could pivot on the wave. And that's, that's going to be interesting to watch. And that's going to be a function of who's got their head in the sand, who's run by private equity, are they run by good management, so it's going to be a tell sign. Yeah, so 
And then what's going to happen with Intel? You know, are they going to go the way of the good way of Microsoft, Apple, even IBM? IBM was sort of teetering on irrelevance, and then it buys Red Hat. And then the, well, the question is, does Pat, Pat, like does cool Pat Gelsinger have the moves? He's got, he's the, got the moves. He's got the knowledge, he's, but is, does he have the he, right stuff? He, he's got the moves. I just think they're too unfocused, and it's too late, unfortunately. And so I, I think he's he, going to give it the college try. And he's he hey, he's proved us wrong before. I think you know? I think. He's but this is a much tougher task because he's wrong. not. It's not software. It's semiconductors, and it's just. You, he, I've I've said this. I, I'm going to say it again. I haven't said it in a, probably a month. <laughs> semiconductor volume is everything, and. He doesn't have the, why is it, so people, maybe most people don't realize this, NVIDIA has an ARM-based architecture. Why? Because it's cheaper, it's standard, you can get the tape out much faster, T TSMC knows how to build this stuff, they, they, they give them the design, they know it's going to work, it's standard. Intel, you know, it, to get the tape out, it just takes much, much longer. And so the problem is, that for, for Intel, is that, Wafer volumes in ARM are 10x those of x86. And so they just don't have the economics anymore. Those economics t uh, changed, flipped, when PCs peaked in 2011. So what's Pat Gelsinger's favorite quote on theCUBE of all time? If you're not on that next wave. You're gonna become driftwood. You're gonna become and he, driftwood. So he's definitely got- He, he knows, Intel he's on looking the waves. At, he knows that he has to surf this wave, he knows get this through better that than economics, I do, right? otherwise I mean, he's toast. He knows the, the semiconductor business right. inside and out. He's amazing at that, in that from that standpoint, but they're still too unfocused. They got a, in my opinion, they're, they're, right. they're still going to have to rethink. Well, we're kind of getting into a rant now, so let's get to the rant section, our rant of the week. What is your rant of the week? Mine is, I'll start off first. My rant of the week is um, the whole Elon Musk Twitter fail. Um, and I also, didn't see all that. You were there. You I, were in the, listening to it. The, the, the Twitter room. Well, right? first of all, my first rant is the, the Washington space. Post wrote an article, which I don't agree with. Some people might not like my opinion of this, but I do not think Elon Musk is building a right wing Twitter social uh, proof, um, truth social rumble clone, even though that David Sachs recently sold his chat company, podcasting company to rumble, which is a, uh, a, a right leaning uh, YouTube wannabe. I think Elon Musk actually wants free speech. From my, from the people I talk to, that some people just hate Elon Musk no matter what. But I think it's wrong to assume that he's gonna, uh, he's building a right wing media venture. Um, that's what the Washington Post politics section calls it. And then the Santos decision was to announce his presidential run on Twitter. And of course, Elon was going to kick off a Spaces. Now Elon was pulling big numbers when he when Elon Musk would do a Twitter Spaces, which is their their like chat uh, voice chat thing, like a clubhouse. It pulls big numbers. He pulls millions of people. So the All In podcast, which I love, I like those guys. Jason Calcanis is very cool. Zach is great. Those guys do a good job. They were pumping up like crazy. Oh, he's coming on my our, 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 basically. They they can not this podcast, but Twitter Spaces and Elon. They're pretty tight. All In guys are tight with Elon. So people assume that it was a right wing action and plus he's right wing dave it crashed it was crashing <laughs> no way the the spaces that started had glitches from the minute it started and uh they were scrambling and uh everyone was on there i was on the i was on there and there's my picture next to DeSantos. the ingram angle what's her name was on there Laura all the ingram. media was on there all the big press people um and it was a press event kind of and it kind of didn't do well they, like i think when i was on there they had 255,000 uh, concurrence. And Jason was predicting, Jason Kilcanis was predicting 5 million. Wow. So I think, personally, my conspiracy I heard, theory. I, I heard David, David Sachs, he was like high-fiving. He said it was fantastic. It was great. Of course, was he was the success. one hosting it. <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't mind Sachs. So um, I'm glad he had that uh, scoop. But the point is, it wasn't the numbers they wanted. I personally think it was a DDoS attack. I think there was some action. I'm waiting to see if it was just a shit platform, but this is a real black eye for Elon Musk because like, he prides himself on being like the product genius and that he's like you know, cutting slack in the organization and cleaning up uh, the tech chops. But it was a huge embarrassment for Amazon, I mean, uh, for, for Twitter. It was not a good look. And then obviously DeSantos hopes I mean, you what was to, he like? What was his rap? He was a stump speech, basically. It was supposed to be authentic, get with the people, you know? 
it was just it was just weak. What do you think of him? You a fan? Uh, don't know yet. You know, I don't like how I don't trust some of the narratives, so I don't know him. I haven't researched him. I don't like I don't like how they're. Uh, I didn't like what he did with with Disney because I love Disney, but I think that was just more press breaking it out of out of, out of proportion. Um, some people don't like him. I'm not sure if he's got the stomach to go the distance because he can't even go up against Trump. I think we need someone who's going to be able to go, go toe-to-toe with Donald Trump and, and be able to handle themselves, not wimp out. Like the last election, you had, what's his name, Bush, Jeb Bush. He folded like a cheap chair. I thought that was weak. I think the Republicans got to do a better job, put a name up there. You know, someone who's a centrist, someone in the middle I like, but I don't want the right wing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, not, I don't know. DeSantis, he, he doesn't grab me. I mean... He's kind of like Trump with a brain, which means I like some of his policies, you know. But Someone says, man from Florida is running like, for president. You know, a Florida listen, man is running for president. <laughs> but I'll listen to like podcasts of, of individuals and I'll try to, you know, stick with them. The hashtag was disaster. But, disaster. <laughs> like a disaster. I was listening to him. He was interviewed by, uh, who's the British guy who uh, does those long form interviews? And I just, I got halfway through. I'm like, the, ah, enough. The, I can't the, take the it The problem anymore. I have with the politics is that it's all talking points. That's why I kind of like this all in podcast, what they're doing, because they're at least stoking a conversation and they're not, they're transparent about their politics. I mean, David Sachs is like, he's like, hey, I'm right wing. I'm a right leaning person. Calcanis is like more of a centrist. Yeah, they, uh, they and, do a good job. They got, it's funny though, sometimes, I mean, they, they're very knowledgeable individuals. And then sometimes they go into a space that I know really well. And I'm like, they, they don't know what they're talking yeah. about. But, uh, they, but they don't know, but the, I, no, but they I don't know. They don't know the enterprise. But we're, <laughs> we're the enterprise podcast. <laughs> but I presume they do know. I mean, they know economics well. And, and, and the one guy knows science really well, yeah. Freeberg. And, and, yeah, and they're some, entertaining. Jason's pull. good. Jason, I got to give him. You used to work with him, right? Yeah, uh, Jason. He was, did a podcast when I was at PodTech. And Jason's a good guy. He loves media. He hustles. He's, he's, a guy, he's from New York area. Um, He's opinionated, which I don't mind, and uh, he tells it how it is. Some people don't like him at all, but you know, yeah, I've well, never had an issue with him. Like he's got a family; he's a family guy, and you know, he's got a successful podcast. He built that thing up. I think that pod, they were on two, I think they're two hundred episodes now, but they're pulling big numbers. Yeah, and I think he's right about the numbers. They are rivaling these cable news outlets, and I think you know, Rob Hope and our team was giving me some stats for for this podcast that. The, the media people are poo-pooing the, the numbers. Uh, and it, but it is comparing apples to oranges. And, and DeSantos' numbers, even though small on, on the 250,000, the time on site, no one stays on, watches on Twitter. But they want that more. So Twitter's not to be compared with TV. But if you still reach 5 million people, it's asynchronous. So it's like, it's a whole nother thing, right? So Plus there's a it, long tail it's that, not, that, that the, the mainstream media doesn't, doesn't get, get yeah. to, right? So my rant is punching up is cool for the, for, the, for the Twitter spaces, but they overplayed their hand. And this whole trying to brand Twitter as a right wing network is, I think, a little bit ridiculous. And I think Elon has to, to your point, on multiple pods, you've been saying they got to get more point counterpoint on there yeah i mean Immedi- immediately i mean i guess i'll follow up with that rant my my one of my favorite shows when i was a younger man was the mclaughlin group right mclaughlin group he was a hardcore right-wing republican he worked in the nixon administration and other republican administrations and and but he would create this balance right he would get you know a couple liberal people he'd get somebody who's down the middle and they'd hash it out and you'd you'd, you'd hear it and that's why I do like those guys on the on the all in because they do get different perspectives and and I think that that's what we try to do in the cube as well. It's like okay, well that's what we did today with Floyer and breaking analysis. We'll be publishing that, you know, this weekend. Um, so and you know there's this good Twitter meme going on with the the repatriation thing. I just I just chimed in. You know a lot of people saying never. I think Edge is the wild card there, right? I think Edge could be the the tipping point for a lot of these sort of on prem companies. I think the problem is they just don't have the the pace of innovation that the cloud companies do. But hey, John, you know as well as I do, you start to get big, the innovator's dilemma, yeah. you start to get bogged down, it takes longer to move. You know, can can they can they keep moving as fast as they can? It's leadership. It's leadership, man. I mean, I remember I so clearly remember when I was young when the web hit. It was so obvious to many of us. We're like, okay, this is obvious. And not obvious to many others. We were scratching our heads saying, how could people like like senior exists, not get it. They just weren't paying attention, Dave. They no. weren't actually on it. Same with the cloud, right? 
And so they were cloud you know, deniers for the longest time. <laughs> Remember, oh. Carl called Amazon a bookseller. And he tried they, he, he, VMware tried to launch its own cloud <laughs> that failed miserably. Pat was in charge then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're going to do this. Ah, and finally, they figured it out. It took years. Yeah. Finally well, OpenStack it out. had big promise. Remember, then Amazon yeah. started growing. If you look at Amazon stock price, 2012 and 2013 was the kick up. Yeah. The slope really ramped up. And I think that was the early years when you saw a real value kicking in. And then, you know, 2010, it was just like, ah, oh, just do it yourself. Um, but yeah, good stuff. All right, Dave, great to see you. That's wrapping up our podcast here for episode uh, 13. Of course, go to siliconangle.com. It's growing. We've got a great community there. The cube.net to find out where the cube's going to be. Uh, it's a great site to check out what's going on there. We've got videos there as well. It's kind of on-demand environment as well as our YouTube channel. But siliconangle is the site you want to go to for all the news real time. Uh, reporting, opinion, analysis on siliconangle.com and that community is growing. Ask us anything you want there and hit us up. Tell me what you think. And uh, if you have seen any guests out there you think we should be bringing on, let us know. Dave, that's wrapping up episode 13. I'm in Boston. All, All right. right, go Celtics. Got Thanks the hat. for watching. Let's knock wood. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>